There was a time when I would only approach stages like this as Madeline. You would have loved Madeline. She was gorgeous, powerful, courageous. She was everything I would have wanted you to see in me. I would perform as Madeline, transform into her when I needed to stand up to the world. I wrote a gossip column in the local gay magazine, and with Madeline as my guide, I got away with being scandalous. <laughs> Madeline walked the runway for Macy's. Madeline danced intimately with the Grace Jones and even performed live with Madonna. My drag persona, Madeline, became my new identity. And transforming into her helped me to control how others saw me, related to me, and maybe even loved me. Now, I noticed that a moment ago, when I identified Madeline as my drag persona, just a few of you leaned in. Because if you know, you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> but most of you were unmoved, as if having a drag persona isn't an experience that each and every one of us shares. As a former drag queen and current psychotherapist, one thing I've realized in my practice is that right now, everyone is in drag. We dress and adorn ourselves based on how we want to be accepted and what helps us to belong. If you love your sports team, you wear their colors and dress according to the team's persona. That's drag. It helps you to fit in, find your people, and feel seen. If you wear your university's colors or carry certain paraphernalia to represent your sorority or your fraternity, that's your drag. But on social media, drag is a whole other ballgame. Because there we can feel even more disconnected from the person we actually see in the mirror. Online, people are wearing filters, performing, basically putting on a show. It has become a part of their identity, an identity that has nothing to do with who they truly are. And that's dangerous. Because when you are constantly in drag, you become more focused on how you are rather than who you are. That's why today I stand before you not as Madeline, but as Matt Cartwright. I am an ordained interfaith minister, trauma-informed psychotherapist, author, and former diva. <laughs> I'm often perceived as someone who has always had it together. But many times, it is your darkest moments that lead you toward who and how you are meant to serve, which is the reason I became a psychotherapist and also how I know another drag queen when I see one, whether they are covering up in person or online. Being Madeline came at a cost. I got lost in an illusion without a clear vision, lacking a strong sense of self rooted in values and principles to guide me was dangerous. The nightlife became my life. Late nights fueled by drugs and alcohol led to days without sleeping, sometimes spending 18 hours in a full face of makeup, still in drag, wearing the mask. Whenever I experienced rejection, I immediately sought to find out what must be wrong with me. If you think you're broken, you will constantly look for ways to fix yourself. A desire to know what must be wrong with me is a prevalent issue permeating throughout our society, causing people to eagerly attach themselves to any label that fits. Scrolling through social media, questioning who you are and your worth with every trending video you swipe, it's so unconscious that people have a hard time feeling like they know themselves because too many versions of us exist. And the algorithms feed into this confusion by pushing more triggering content your way every time you like, save, or follow. What's happening? We are trading self-awareness for self-assessment, and it's hurting us. 
mental illness rates are rising significantly with an estimated 20% of U.S. adults having some form of mental health disorder. Mental health is a trending topic. I've noticed that my clients are constantly diagnosing themselves based on whatever mental illness of the week their favorite social media therapist has added trending music to. But as someone who has experienced both sides of the couch, I believe there's a deeper issue at play. This isn't a mental health crisis we're experiencing. We are in the midst of a collective struggle with identity. People are too focused on how they are and not focused enough on who they are being. As a psychotherapist in the digital age, I'm begging you to focus less on your mental health and to focus more on your identity. Your brain is wired to find the answers that fit your questions. So when you are constantly questioning who you are and what's wrong with you, the algorithm of your mind will meet what you seek. If you have trouble focusing, social media will tell you that it's because you have ADHD. It is now more common for people to bond over being ADHD than over healthy interests, values, or goals. We think a diagnosis is the answer, as if having a label solves the problem. A label may describe how you are, but it does not define who you are. Sometimes I work with clients who feel that they have found their thing and they no longer need support because they've attached themselves to a label that gives them something else to fix. Such was the case just a few weeks before receiving one of the worst telephone calls in my life. Scrolling through the news on a regular morning, I read the headline that someone had jumped off a famous building near my home in New York City. Immediately, I was saddened by the news of such a tragic death, but I wasn't expecting what was to come. Suddenly, the phone rang. It was my neighbor calling. Brian is dead, he blurted out. Frozen, I realized that Brian, one of my patients, was who I'd read about online that morning. I was in disbelief, pushing away the guilt as it began squeezing in on me, took every tool I had. Brian had stopped seeing me for therapy just three weeks prior. My mind ran through our very last session, racking my brain over every little detail, wondering, could I have said something different? Did I miss something? Is it my fault he ended therapy and his life? I've had clients die from overdose before, but never suicide. This was a first. But I knew it wasn't an incident to view in isolation. Something was happening here. I studied our sessions along with common issues among my patients, and it was then when I really began to notice the dire situation that we are in as a society. We are in the midst of a collective identity crisis, scrolling through social media, questioning who you are and your worth after every 45 seconds. People have a hard time feeling like they know themselves. The looking glass self-concept was created by sociologist Charles Cooley. According to Cooley, we are primed to design our identities around who people think we are. We also naturally take feedback from others and try to present to them a version of ourselves that we want them to have. Way back in 1902, Cooley had already let us know that given a platform like Instagram, we would create versions of ourselves that we want others to see while taking their feedback very personally. But what happens when we have multiple platforms 
that create different looking glass self experiences. I'll tell you what happens because I see it on my couch weekly. Anxiety, addiction, loneliness, and ultimately despair. Because when different versions of you exist in different places, you don't feel authentic. You feel like an imposter. There's the TikTok you, the Facebook you, the Instagram you. We were never meant to have this much endless feedback or criticism about who we are. What I've come to know and the tool I wish I had had the opportunity to gift my former client, Brian, is that your identity, who you are, is a matter of practice. In the same way we ask ourselves and one another how we are in order to gauge our well-being, it is equally important to ask yourself and those you love, who are you being? Who are you being when you're interacting on social media? Who are you being when you are criticized, triggered, loved? Meeting my clients with who are you being rather than how are you doing has greatly shifted experiences in my practice. The key to becoming the best version of ourselves is not having the right answers, but asking ourselves the right questions. In order to feel authentically you, you must consider all of who you are. Who are you being? When you focus more on who you choose to be, you are less likely to put on your drag as a cry for connection. Roles change, careers change, status changes, but your values remain at the center of who you are, who you choose to be. So the next time you start to diagnose yourself with something that has gone viral, stop. Ask yourself, who am I being? And how could I be even more of who I desire to be? Standing here as Matt Cartwright, the psychotherapist, I also want to honor Madeline, who, although isn't the shining star on this stage, helped me to embrace more of my own identity and be proud of who I am. Before Madeline was little Matt, who grew up as a young boy in Texas, knowing that he was different. I did my best to fit in using humor to deflect from the loneliness inside. The fear of bullying was a large part of my experience as a boy who was gay, a label I was told to be deeply ashamed of. I started having facial tics, as if trying to say the words, I'm gay, but they wouldn't come out. Doctors could not explain my symptoms. So they gave me two heavy duty psychiatric drugs. No therapy, just medication. I wanted to end my life. I spent my entire childhood running from a label society deemed unacceptable. No one should have to experience life this way. And I hope that you will join me in making sure that no one ever has to suffer behind a mask again. Little Matt, Madeline, Brian, and my many incredible clients have helped me learn that who you choose to be in every moment is what makes up your identity. And that is what truly matters. So, who are you being today? Thank you.